Thank you, uh, Ben, and thank you to Parish of St Mark's Picton for your support and your interest and your keenness in this organ project right from the very sad beginnings to the present, uh, present moment. I hope this will be a wonderful uh, acquisition for you and an enhancement of your worship in the church. I have to do some housekeeping first, and Jeff Lloyd asks that if any of you haven't signed in yet, would you please do that with him? He'll have a clipboard, and he'll be happy to relieve you of some money if you're a member, or, or not if you're a parishioner. So you'll have to decide how to handle that with him when you, uh, when you see him. I forget how that works. The story about this organ would make good reading in any context, and very few people would, would believe it, really, if it weren't true. It's, it's actually a tale of two organs, isn't it, I guess? Uh, several organ builders of floods and destruction, of sea voyages over a distance of 17,000 kilometres, several, of bureaucrats, and finally a bit of a happy ending. For those that don't know, the first organ here was uh, by Wordsworth, of Leeds in England, an organ of about 1893. It stood at the back of the transept there. You parishioners will know that all too well. It was the only organ in Australia by that firm, uh, though the one that we restored in St Luke's Enmore uh, recently was by Wordsworth and Maskell, so that was a partnership involving the same guy. But in his own right, Wordsworth uh, built only one instrument that came here, uh, and that stood over there. Uh, You'll know that, um, well, we took over tuning in 1975, the first time I saw it, a while ago. Um, then it was not tuned for a very long time, uh, till about uh, 2009, I think, at which stage we took over the maintenance again of it, and under the guidance, I think, of Ben and of Russell, the organist, we st and Peter Meyer, who had a great interest in the project, we formulated a scheme for restoring the Wordsworth organ, and we did some of that. We re-leathered the bellows, uh, we re-leathered uh, some of the, the flute stoppers, and we'd gone a certain way towards what would have been an ongoing project to restore the Wordsworth organ, uh, and a lovely organ it was. Sadly, however, the uh, flood came, of course, in uh, 2016 or 15, 16. And the organ was removed for safekeeping, uh, having been under two metres of water, like the rest of the church, you can see the, the plaque. Um, the insurers and St Mark's and ourselves um, agonised over the best policy for this instrument. Uh, in the end, there was, it, it hadn't been all that long on the water, but it was long enough that every single key, every single component of the action, that is several thousand small wooden parts, would have to be individually restored. And sadly, the decision was taken that it just was beyond viable restoration. If somebody has unlimited time and would like to tinker with it, I'm sure we'd like to hear from you if you'd like to give the organ a new home and had years of, of restoration time to spend with it on a non-commercial basis, we'd be very pleased to hear and that a new home might be found for it. In August of 2017, the insurers uh, approved a scheme to use this organ, the redundant organ, uh, which was in our factory, uh, which curiously also comes from Leeds in England. Now this organ was built by a builder called J.J. Binns, James Jepson Binns. His nickname in the trade in England to this day was Battleship Binns, <laughs> and that's because his organs are very, very solid and very, very well crafted. Uh, they are Rolls Royces of organs. You can see just how good the quality is. It's highly ironic that it would come from Leeds, uh, at the same time, it's 10 years newer than the old one. This is 1903, 10 years difference. Um, most interestingly, it's the only example of a Binns organ at all in Australia, despite the fact that he was quite famous and he built organs in institutions like Rochdale Town Hall, one of his biggest, most famous organs. Another one, uh, where's the other famous? Oh, the Albert Hall in Nottingham, another famous one. Um, he didn't export any organs, I don't know why. Uh, that obviously wasn't the thing. By 1903, uh, Australia had its own organ building industry so that English instruments weren't so often imported. So it's something of golden opportunity. Um, he built smaller organs like this right around England. I had the interesting experience about 20 years ago to tune one for a colleague in a little town in Northamptonshire called Olney. Al almost identical <coughs> organ. It's my first and only experience of a Binns organ, apart from this one. So it's been an interesting uh, experience. He also built Jesus College uh, organ in Oxford, so it's probably one of his more famous organs. You can hear that on CDs accompanying the very fine choir there singing. 
This organ, however, came from uh, Mitten, All Hallows in Great Mitten, in Lancashire, just south of Yorkshire. They're not so far away from Leeds, where he worked. Um, in, there is a Great Mitten and there is Little Mitten, and looking at Google the other night, I noticed that the combined population of Great and Little Mitten is 216. <laughs> so I don't know how Great is Great and how Little is Little, but suffice to say that the Anglican Church in uh, Great Mitten uh, found itself in dire straits uh, about 20 years ago and had a, an organ which was surplus to requirements. Um, at about that time, we had clients at uh, Pitwater House School in Sydney um, who were looking for an, another organ. They just had an organ from Newcastle, which we'd moved to the school. Now, Rex Morgan, the patriarch of the Morgan family that founded and owned Pitwater House School, um, had a, has a stately house in Bathurst called Abercrombie House. Some of you may have been there on tours. Very famous big bluestone mansion. And in that house is a lovely ballroom and Rex had the great vision that an organ could go in the ballroom. And meanwhile, a friend of mine, uh, and a colleague of many years, found the, uh, this bin's organ, wanting a home in England. Uh, one thing led to another, and the uh, Morgan family decided this would be a, an excellent organ for the ballroom at, Pitwater House, at uh, Abercrombie House. And uh, negotiations commenced 20 years ago exactly. I've been looking through the file. 1999, we started talking about that. And Rex purchased the organ in 2000, in June of 2000. It was shipped in July of 2000. Uh, ships in the old days, when organs like this came to Australia, had wonderful names, the Fox Glove, uh, all sorts of marvellous names. But this was called the Trade Eternity. I'm not sure that's terribly romantic, but it came to Australia on the Trade Eternity in 2000. There was huge enthusiasm for the project with the Morgan family, but then they ran up a foul of the local council and the National Trust and neither of whom wanted permission to be given for a gallery which would have been at least that size in their ballroom. Essentially, the council and the bureaucrats just felt that the organ was too big, even for a ballroom in Abercrombie House. So the Morgans were um, stuck with an organ, and, uh, which was stored in our factory at that stage. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we had also re the bellows of the organ for them, so it was a partly restored organ anyway and done some work, and there was huge, because everything we saw of this organ said it, it's a Rolls Royce, it's looking for a good home. However, uh, one thing led to another in 2017, the insurance company thought this would make a better organ, this would make a more viable proposition for Picton than the poor old Birdsworth, so here it is now. It's an ideal size for the church, I think you'll agree tonally, it, it carries to the back, it will lead the singing and the worship, I hope, very nicely. Uh, you've put that to the test um, yesterday, I guess. I hope it came through all right. I wasn't there. Um, in a little while, Ben will show you some photos of the inside because that's a little bit tight inside there. We can't take you all in, so we'll see some of that. But it's, as I said before, it's very, very well made, beautifully constructed inside. It's very pleasant to play. It has uh, lovely luxury features. It's very, for its period, it's very modern. It has, for organists, it has curved stop jams. It has radiating concave pedal board. It has beautiful thick ivory keys, they're a pleasure to play. We've done nothing to those other than refelt them there exactly as they, uh, as they left England. The restoration work was very much textbook. We've relevered the bellows already. We, re we uh, restored the two main soundboards. We restored all the lovely action. Um, we restored the pipe work, uh, several hundred pipes to restore in that, uh, which was in pretty good condition anyway. And then, uh, perhaps most importantly, we tried very hard in doing the, the voicing and the tonal finishing in the church to preserve it pretty much as Binns left it. Uh, he was an interesting character. Um, the case is a very solid looking case, as you can see, of English oak, beautifully made, among very other, some other clever things which our Jordan uh, Gutteridge has done. He's uh, uh, restored the pieces. It was very much cut up the case in the 1930s in England because in the organ loft in England, it had raked stairways going to the back, up the gallery, so the choir could be um, raked up. And where they put the rakes in the gallery, in the floor level, they cut, zigzagged into the organ case. Jordan's done a wonderful job. We've had to use American oak because English oak's not so easily available these days. But if you can see where they are, you'll be doing very well if you can spot, the, uh, if you can spot where the changes have been made. And we're very grateful for our, all our staff, for Rodney, for Jordan, and for the others who've uh, assisted right through this project. It's very much a team project. 
One of the interesting connections of the organ is that one of the more famous Australian organ builders of the time, till about 1940, was uh, William Leopold Roberts, who worked in Adelaide, uh, did work a lot of work in Sydney, a lot of work in Melbourne, uh, all, around the, all around the country. Roberts was in fact trained and apprenticed to Binns in Leeds. And it's been very interesting working on the organ, seeing some of the things which influence Roberts, familiar, the way the familiar sites to us, the way the soundboards are laid out, those of you who understand that, the way where the off notes are and where the, where the rest of the pipes are, uh, things like the, uh, the tuning slides not meeting, leaving a gap in the tuning slides, quite deliberate. Uh, and I wonder, as we sometimes don't know where Roberts out here got his pipes from, I actually wonder if he might have bought them from Leeds, from Bins. We'll, we'll never know that one, really. Um, one thing you can't do, as I said, is get inside the organ to have a look, so I thought it would be a good opportunity. Um, I can talk you through some of the photographs we've taken during um, both the, the restoration and the, uh, the installation of the organ. We can talk you through some of those the slides. Please ask any questions now or during the slides or later. Is there an apprenticeship for this work? If there were apprentices, there would be an apprenticeship, yes. Uh, yes. So no one young coming on? No one at the moment. Jordan is a, is a tender 23? Four. Four. Um, so there's the future. Jordan, my colleague Murray Allen, Rodney Ford, uh, all of them well and truly under, uh, under 50. Uh, so there, there's, some, uh, there's some, some good things. But we do need more. Organ building does need more, uh, does need more talent. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting too old to be doing this for too much long. So uh, we do need some more. Here, here is the beginning of the installation of the organ. There's the, the, just the bare building frame on the floor of the platform there. There, there, there is the organ going in. Um, here you can see the bellows there. The enormous double rise bellows for those interested in those things. Thanks. This is looking down on the swell soundboard. This is the box the pipes sit on, so it's looking downward. And you can see there the pneumatic action tubes running off to work the bass notes of the swell. Lovely upper boards, lovely timber. Now that is the uh, pedal, um, that's just the console of the organ, looking at the console of the organ. This is what we call the pneumatic touch box, the tubes coming out to work the pneumatic action for the uh, pedal board on and bass flute. The uh, pedal couplers, roller boards and backfalls here. Some lovely new backfalls, which I think Rodney made, uh, of here timber to replace the old ones which had broken and decayed too much. So he's, he's, he's used the broken ones, odd, odd broken ones, he's, he's replaced with other old ones and put the new ones in the top. So they look and work almost exactly the, uh, the same. A question, Peter. In modern organ building, would technology have provided you with better material in terms of steel? Not really. Um, it would provide better technology in itself, and so modern instruments might have, for example, computer controls to help uh, to play back uh, to the, the, the little buttons which we push, which remember the combinations of stops. Uh, it's all done electronically, of course, now, and some use of steel and aluminium where it's needed for strength. But in terms of material, quite honestly, an organ like this has such good quality, solid. Uh, timber, leather, although a lot of leather work is new now, there's no real advantage in that, in modernity. It's one of the reasons I personally enjoy restoration work so much. You actually get a chance. If you, anybody who's been through the inside of the Sydney Town Hall organ would know that there are legs of building frame that are like trees, they're that square, that, and they go up 30 or 40 feet into the air. It, it, the, sheer, what, the, the sheer availability of material and labour 100 years ago produced these spectacular results. And technology has reduced the amount of labour necessary, but it hasn't always given us better care quality in some ways. So if you were to build by the restoration expert, if you were to start building an organ from the start, you would still use the same materials? Very similar, yeah. Very similar. yeah. Is it hard to get that sort of leather you want? Getting leather is, is extremely hard, getting good leather, appropriate leather that's historically authentic and will still do the job and will still be here in 100 years mm -hmm. uh, is quite hard. We have to be very careful. Uh, all, all of us have had some very unfortunate experiences 30 years ago, which the leather which, which, turned, which, was, which seemed very good came from very good supply houses and now it's not so good. And of course we very shamefacedly have to save plants and we have to replace that. That, that was an industry issue and that's, that's happened to all of us. Um, but I think now they're tanning leather in the old-fashioned way again. It was a chrome, 
uh, for tanning, and, and that gives a much more reliable product. Again. So once again, strange. So, sometimes the old boys knew more about things than uh, than we do now. What do you think of the Sydney Opera House organ? This is mechanical, isn't it? Yes, that, this? Like, this is also mechanical. Is it? So, yes. So in a sense, the Opera House organ is a return to traditional mechanical action like this organ. Yeah. So what's the other action? Well, it's mechanical action, there's tubular pneumatic action, which pedals, which work pedals in the soil, or there's electric action, um, which, is, which is the solenoids and so on. Um, just following Hazel's question, Hazel, 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 about apprenticeships for making them, I've been here all my life and we've had several really wonderful organists, but um, Russell is just the epitome. <laughs> <laughs> if Russell decides to retire, are there other people who are training to become organists that, that can actually play an organ this size? There's quite, quite a number actually, Joan. Uh, the conservatorium would have, uh, I think, Mark Quornby. How many students at the, at the conservatory? Ten? Ten. Ma Mark and Heather Monboy down the back also teach organ. Uh, but well known local, local teachers. They, they could tell the numbers. You, you have a young organist here in James who, who also plays. Uh, so so there, there is a growing number of people. Yeah, no, I think. Uh, I'm only going to be here another 20 years. No, so. <laughs> that, that makes two of us. <laughs> But I think training organists for church playing, for accompanying and for doing those skills is very important and I think the church has a role in encouraging organists to do that, even if it's only paying for organ lessons uh, and that sort of thing. I think it's very important that the church is involved in doing that because those skills are not being taught at the conservatory. Um, and we're very fortunate to have teachers like Mark and Heather and, and others uh, who have a good number of students of all different kinds, uh, from very young beginners to, to people doing their, their AMSA and almost say very high level. So uh, that's a very, very important part. So back at the slides. Here, here you now see um, some of the inside. You can see the mechanical action inside the organ. Uh, what we call backfall levers at the top, wires going up, phosphor bronze wires going up to the uh, sample. Uh, that's all new, those wires, because the old iron wires had rusted and corroded and had to be replaced. Where possible, we replace as little as we can get away with in a restoration, because we like everything to be preserved historically and authentically, but sometimes you have to obviously renew felled leather and corrodible parts of the order. Here again, you can see these lovely new back four beams there. And a beautiful layout, very neat and tidy. Those of you who know what the inside of the northern looks like, you can see how neat and tidy it is. Page band. First of the pipes going into the great manual, looking out, so looking from inside the organ out towards, you can see the lamp there, looking out. First of the, first of the pipes to go into the organ a few weeks ago. Thanks, Ben. Looking up, the same thing. Here you can see these pneumatic action tubes, lead tubes coming down to work the action of the organ that supplies the wind to the pipes on the front. So many people think that the number of pipes you see in the front of an organ uh, is all that there is to the organ, but of course it's the tip of the iceberg. Curiously with this organ, every pipe from here to the end makes the noise. It's a speaking pipe. However, from here to the right hand side, all those pipes are dummies. It's a very unusual way for the organ to be laid out. And it works rather well for this building, so Bins must have known it's coming in. What's a dummy? Dummy means it makes no noise. It's dummy. So why is it there? Decoration. <laughs> because you've got three, three metres of space. Um, inside the swirl box, incredibly generous. Uh, the, the full length viol, full compass viol for those who are, who are organists. The viol de Kester, which is an extraordinary stop you'll hear shortly, actually goes to bottom C. Uh, Thanks, Ben. Incredibly engineered and crammed in. Again, looking at swirl pipe works. Geigen principal, the old orchestra at the back, uh, with that there with the, with the corks. Ironically, one of the one of the restoration tasks we did on the old Wordsworth organ was to replace these corks in the pipes uh, because they were rotten. They rotted in the atmosphere. However, the ones, funny enough, the ones in the bins are in absolutely immaculate condition. They're very tight and very lovely. So that saved us buying all those wine bottles and having to drink them. <laughs> Here is the lovely, lovely box Angelica and a fourth bird at the front. And again, some, some great pipe work there. Jordan's chisel in the background, I'll give that back to him. 
post that. The wooden pipes at the back of the swirl box, which they might have over to fit them in. And this guy here, bottom C, of the guy in principle on the swell, is so big that even mited over, it was too long for the depth of the swell box. This had to be mited down again. So Jordan and I have uh, bumped our heads countless times. When we were doing the uh, regulation, the voicing a week or two ago, uh, both Jordan and I can tell some stories about that, uh, that part there. But he's, uh, he's better protected than I am. <laughs> Next thing, pedal pipes at the back of the organ. The pedals are on the pneumatic action here. You can see some little servo pneumatic motors with lovely white leather covering on them and the tubes feeding those motors from the pedals, from the touch box in the front. Thanks, Pat. Inside the organ, uh, the uh, roller boards carry spreading action out inside the organ, wires up to the bottom of the sound box. In the front, the grey, in the back, the swell. Thanks, Ben. Most unusually, this organ has uh, concertina wind trunks inside. Um, unlike most organs, which have just wind trunks, which are big and square, solid piece of timber, this one has, uh, you can see the concertina, with the blue very much a German idea, uh, or European, gender cavite coal organs have them, of course, and they're incredibly difficult to re -letter. They take forever to, uh, to do because it's really, essentially, it's like relevering two small bellows just in that one. All I was doing is carrying the wind from the big bellows there to the soundboards above. Uh, very unusual as the organ moves as it play. It's quite interesting to watch. They, they go up and down like pocket hot stand. Pneumatic tubing uh, runs to the pedal organ. Uh, this was in a real mess when it arrived. There were just dozens of tubes all twisted and, and messed up, and we thought it would be best just to, uh, without being too slavish to history, to tidy them up and uh, also to make them uh, modular. So that you can see there, that's actually two joints of timber there, so that it could all be prefabricated at the factory and brought here and just screwed that together. That's Jordan's idea. Full marks to Jordan because that saved a lot of mucking around and it made it an incredibly neat looking pneumatic action running through the back of the hill. Thanks, Pam. Characteristic builders' initials on the bellows ribs. These are cast iron bellows ribs sitting on top of the organ bellows to give the organ its wind pressure. And there's uh, JJ Benz's name there. Thanks, Pam. Okay, that's, that's it. That's it? Okay. So that's the inside. Now I just have to walk you through the some sounds of the organ. Um, then I think Peter Mai wants to. No, Russell's playing, is that right? Is it Russell followed by Peter Ma? Russell, the always wants to play, and Peter Ma wants to play. Then we hand over to everybody and you all have a play. So I'll walk you through and play some pieces. Um, before I forget, however, may I just caution you, those that are playing, as yet there was no railing and no safety device by the console. Please take great care when you get on and off the organ. Uh, here are some of the sounds of the organ, starting with the very softest sound, the uh, swell. Uh, Vox Angelica, which is a kind of a dulciana stop, for those of you who know that. Uh, interestingly, this goes down to bottom G uh, compass, which is very unusual for an, uh, for an untuned uh, undulating stop. And even then, after that, it borrows the rest. So it gives you actually full 58 note compass on, on an out of tune stop, which is rather good. Now, the Vox Angelica is retiring uh, and a little bit diminutive and dulciana-ish. The other string, the viola orchestra, is not. Together they make, um, well, they make sans piece. Paris is very fashionable to be talking about French organs at the moment. Here's sans piece. makes a lovely uh, solo stop, in fact, and I guess that's what it's there for, to be a kind of pseudo-oboe. So here it is against the great Dulciana. Four foot flute added, it's 
still almost like an orchestral oboe.